Good morning. It's so good to join you all today, either through your television or uh, through some streaming device. And I'm happy to know that uh, many of you are still in your night clothes, Maxine, uh, with your coffee and just being comfortable in your homes. So I, I'm very glad that we are together. I read this week a cool term that said church by Zoom or church in the room. Now, some of you may not recognize the term Zoom, but that's the streaming, I guess you call it, device that we at First Baptist use for our uh, interaction in teaching. Um, but this morning, my heart really would love to be in the room with all of you, um, maybe around tables or in the sanctuary where we can study together. And hopefully it won't be very long until we are able to do that again. But today's topic uh, would be a great one for us to hear each other's um, thoughts as we read God's word because um, we're looking at Romans chapter 13 and Paul is uh, talking to the church in Rome about authority. Now, many of us uh, sort of um, shake our heads when we think about authority. Um, having been in the school system, I spent quite a bit of time uh, maybe even with some of you, and talking about authority. And I found it very interesting that um, it's, it's something that is very individual in the ways that we carry it out. And some of us um, are okay with authorities, and we have a fairly good uh, concept about that. And others of us, um, probably came into the world wanting our way. Uh, sometimes I think newborn babies, as they scream, scream, mine, 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 as soon as they're born. But it is part of us that, um, that we have uh, issues with authority. Paul goes back in earlier chapters to remind us of a couple of things uh, that I think will help us to get a good uh, hold on this. Number one is that God is sovereign. God is the authority. And um, he will, as he brings his eternal plan to conclusion, he will continue to be that authority. Also, that God ordained and established certain uh, guidelines and institutions when he created the world so that humanity uh, could ha live and have be in relationship together. It is chaos without some kind of rule. And God is a God of order, as we have seen uh, in, from the beginning in Genesis. So he established authority, human authority. So the first part of chapter 13, I think the first seven verses, we are hearing um, the words that the Holy Spirit gave Paul for the Roman church and also for us today. Then at verse eight, it's almost like it triggers something in Paul's thought and he changes the main topic from uh, governmental authority to um, loving that we should love others. And he goes back to um, Mark and he gives us again the great commandment um, after he gives the commandment that came from Leviticus about how we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. The second commandment, he says, is this, that you love others in the way that you love yourself. 
So Paul picks that thought up in the middle of the scripture. And then at the end, he closes out by talking about um, how short our lives are and that we don't want to waste our lives as believers. We want to have a meaningful life. So we're going to take um, a brief look at this today, and hopefully it will uh, stir your interest enough that you might want to study this a little bit further. But um, before we go further, let's, um, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to give us insight into his word. Father, thank you. Thank you once again for your holy word. Thank you for giving it to us so that we would know who you are and that we would understand um, your direction for our lives. That we would learn of your sovereignty and Lord, most of all that we would um, see the thread that runs through it of your divine plan that you're not taken by surprise by anything that's going on in your creation and what you um, spoke into existence. So give us, Lord, your Holy Spirit in a way that we will um, have meaning and um, that we will grow in you as we study this word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as I began to study this, I came across um, a statement that said this, the world is watching the church, meaning the church universal, all of us believers. The city of Rogersville and Hawkins County and the state are watching us as believers. And the church, is watching the sky and I thought about that for a minute and then when I when I got to the end of chapter 13 I began to understand what he was saying here or what that um, statement meant and what it is and what we are going to um, try to learn today is that we believers are being watched as we walk in God's light. And if we're going to do that effectively, we cannot keep our eyes on the day-to-day -day, um, happenings of the world, but we have to keep our eyes and our thoughts on the fact that this world is not our home. Uh, Pastor mentioned that two Sundays ago uh, in his sermon when he talked about um, that our time is short, how the Lord teaches us in song to number our days, and that we don't want to um, end up with a meaningless life. And that thought remained with me for quite some time because um, I realized that we have dual citizenship. We are citizens spiritual citizens of heaven, and we are also um, citizens of this world. We are citizens um, in Rogersville and, and in the United States, and um, we're part of humanity. So we have dual citizenship. And so the fact that this world is not our home, we are not settlers here. We are pilgrims. Sometimes I forget that, um, especially in these days of uh, stay-at-home orders and um, things that we uh, have been never familiar with. And when it feels like the people are telling us what to do or the government is telling us what to do, I forget that this is not my home and that I am just passing through. So that's the three things that Paul is putting together here in chapter 13 as he's continuing to uh, talk 
to the Roman uh, church, to the church of Rome. So first of all, we talk about authority and I kind of laugh to myself um, because authority is um, something that the majority of us, um, we sort of stiffen our backs a little bit when we think about uh, who is telling us what we can do. I think I was about 16 when I first recall um, telling my mother that uh, when I got 18, I was gonna get a trailer and then I could do what I wanted to do. And she was a very wise woman. She was unperturbed and she said, and so how are you gonna buy that trailer? And I didn't really have an answer. And then the next question was, and where are you gonna park it? So the point was well taken that we, um, we are dependent on others. And specifically in chapter 13, uh, Paul is saying we are part of the government and therefore we are required to comply. So I think about the Apostle Paul and what we know about him specifically when he was Saul and I just don't see him as being a compliant person. But we recognize too that on the road to Damascus, when God spoke to Paul, actually when they had a collision, uh, Paul learned to respect. He learned to respect God. And, and so number one here, is we are to love and respect the Lord Jesus. He is the ultimate authority. And we see that uh, in the Old Testament. We hear Jesus saying uh, when he was on trial uh, that the, the rules are these. Uh, you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And the second commandment is you love your neighbor as yourself. So we will hear that as I begin to read the scripture. And then the very end, we, we talk about, or uh, Paul talks about the reason that we do that is because um, we're not settlers here. So, I'm going to be reading from the New Century Version today, and I'm beginning in chapter 13, verse 1. All of you must yield to the government rulers. This is a command. No one rulers rules unless God has given him the power to rule, and no one rules now without that power from God. So Paul is saying here, uh, you are a citizen of this government. He was a citizen of Rome at the time, one of the most um, depraved uh, countries, cities of the world. Nero was in charge, but he didn't say, if they're godly, you do what they're saying. He said godly or ungodly, Government power has been given by God to authorities and you are to comply. And so he goes on, let's, let's see where we go from there. So those who are against the government are really against what God has commanded and they will bring punishment on themselves. So here he is saying as citizens, uh, there are many levels of authority. God knows them all. Uh, are they all uh, righteous? No. The longer I live, I find that the fewer appear to be righteous. But God is saying you still have an obligation. So if you don't want to be afraid of the law and speeding of getting a ticket and having to pay or go to jail, then do what's right and you won't have to worry. Those 
who do right do not have to fear the rulers. And here the Greek uh, for that means the authorities, those who are in charge. And we know there are many layers of authority. So if you don't want to be afraid, then do what is right and they will praise you. The ruler is God's servant to help you. Now, again, the Greek translation here for servant means minister, not a preacher, but a person who is put in place to carry out this responsibility. But if you do wrong, be afraid. He has the power to punish. He is God's servant to punish those who do wrong. So you must yield to the government, not only because you might be punished, but because you know that it is right. So here, what we find is that God has given authority to governmental offic officials. God knew that without uh, order in society, there would be chaos. There was no promise that the society would be a Christian society. But as Christians, when we live in that society, we are to obey the rules. There is one um, important thing here that he points out, and that is we are to obey the rules unless they are against God's rule. We are to always um, obey God rather than man. Like I said, this is a very um, deep topic, and so we're barely touching the surface here. But Paul is saying, you're citizens, and as a citizen, you have a civic, a civic responsibility. So you are to uh, obey the rule unless it is against God's rule. And we see some examples um, of Paul being in jail for preaching the gospel, uh, but he wasn't trying to break out. The best example, I guess, is Jesus. Um, he gave up his right um, because of the civil law and he died on the cross. Um, he gave up his life on the cross. So we are to be good citizens in every way that we can. We are to be submissive to the government. This does not mean that uh, we have to agree or participate in uh, things that are wrong, things that we do not believe. But it does um, teach us that when what's going on in governmental affairs contradicts God's law, we are to um, follow God's law. It also reminds us that, that when it looks so wrong, we are to remember that God's purpose, his eternal plan, has not been uh, unfolded for us yet. So when we have people over us in authority that um, seem ungodly, we are reminded that God is their authority and he rules them. And they're only there because he allowed them to be there in that place. So Paul is saying governments were created to help society uh, to have some kind of order. And the true function of government was to help control our sinful nature as humanity and not let our selfish desires get out of control. So 
That's why God established people, ministers or servants, in different levels of authority. Paul is not urging us to follow blindly immoral leaders who would lead us into sin, but he is reminding us of debts. We are to trust him. We are to trust him. That's the sovereign God, and that's a lesson that can't be just learned as we sit here today. We have to work on that through his word in our own hearts, that we learn that God is in control, and his nature is good, and his purpose is eternal. So we learn to trust him. Now, let's move then to um, the second part where he talks about um, us having debt. We realize as if we look um, a little further into the scripture that he is, that Paul is not saying don't ever borrow money. There are people, some very important um, contributors to the understanding of the gospel. Spurgeon was one who believed that we were not to ever borrow. But as we continue through, we see that Paul's point was more um, about paying timely and paying those debts that we have and doing it according to our promise. And then he brings up this one really significant debt, and it's one that we all have and will continue to have. And that is the debt of love that we owe to each other. We owe a debt of love to every person. And that comes from the second commandment that I mentioned earlier, that we are to love others in the same way that we love ourselves. Now, you see that is a tremendous challenge, and I really would like that conversation all together in a room as we, as we understand that. But we realize that that goal, we should have that goal to love others as we love ourselves. Uh, it's a struggle. It's, it's a struggle for me every day uh, to not judge and to love other people. But he reminds us that there was one who paid a debt that he did not owe, and that was Jesus. And so I, I remembered the song and the title of it is Jesus Paid It All. Most of you are familiar with that. And it, it just totally covers this scripture. And just a few of the words says this, I can hear Jesus say, your strength is very weak. Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me your all in all. Jesus paid it all. He did on the cross with his blood. So all to him we owe. And it was our sin that caused that. He paid our debt through his blood. And so as I thought about the fact that my debt was paid for with the precious blood of Jesus, it gave me a perspective that I hadn't had before. And that helps me as I journey toward loving my neighbors as I love myself. So Paul then moves to the last um, part, the last verses. And um, this is what he says, beginning with verse 11. Do this because we have, we live in an important time. So he's saying, be a good citizen. Um, do all you can with your life so that the people in your community would look and when they heard your name would say, 
he's he was a good man or he was a good woman why it is now time for you to wake up from your sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed the light is almost finished and the day is almost here so we should stop doing things that belong to darkness and take up the weapons used for fighting in the light. Let us live in a right way like people who belong to the day. We should not have wild parties and get drunk. There should be no sexual sin of any kind, no fighting or jealousy or envy, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and forget about satisfying your own sinful self. So the word night here is a symbol of our sinful world. We live in a sinful world. We were born with that disease, the disease of sin. And we he's pointing out that this is going to soon come to an end and we need to be prepared because once the end is here, there is no redemption. We need to make that right now. And then the symbol of day is a symbol of a good time that is coming when we will be with God. And so as, as I just bring this to a conclusion, there are many um, thoughts and other um, questions and answers that are in the scripture. But as we as we think about how it all goes together and what it might mean in our lives, um, I think it I think it would be this: the world is watching the church in COVID-19, in economic times. As the church begins to reopen and we develop a plan, we as Christians have the opportunity to be, um, to be good examples. I read a very good article this week from Gospel, the Gospel Coalition and the title is Church don't let COVID virus divide you. If you're interested in that article, uh, you can message me on Facebook. But it brought one really good point that I want to close this with you today. We do have authority. Someone has to be in charge on every level. So we remind ourselves that God is in control. And in whatever level of authority we are, we want that um, light that we get from the Holy Spirit to help us as we exercise that authority. So the world is watching the church. And as we reopen, there may be things um, that are offered by or suggested or required by the CDC or that the pastor and the people, the team who will put this reopening together feels are necessary. And there'll be all kinds of opinions about whether or not that's the right thing. But in this article, um, it said this, so you might not want to social distance. You might not want to wear a mask or not pass the offering plate. But just suppose that you are not right about that. And so could you not give up your own desire in order to get along with the people who are around you? So I think it's just reminding us that we are all in a different place with this. And so it is not a place for judgment. It is a place for grace. So when the world is watching the church, how do we do this? How do we offer grace? 
We offer grace because the church is watching the sky. Why the sky? Because the word of God says that Jesus is going to return. And he will make all things new. And he is our father. And so we want to and we desire to be made more and more into his image. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, Lauren. Mm. Such, um, such strong and important topics that we have here today. Grant us your grace, Lord. Change our hearts. Um, cause us to look at ourselves and um, to take action in ways that we need to give us grace instead of judgment. And cause us, Lord, to realize that we are settlers and not we are pilgrims and not settlers. We are, we are not going to live here. We are dual citizens. And the, that heaven is our home that we are just passing through. We thank you for your love and your protection and the leadership that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.